All right, we're ready to get started now with Julian and Clemens. Move, move it together, be gone. Cool. All right, thank you. Um, so, as many of you know, this uh, is a follow-up talk on the Mophiscator talk done by Chris Thomas last year. So my first quick question would be, who attended that talk or saw it recorded online? Okay. Well, actually, that's quite a good number. Actually, quite a bit. Okay, so um, our subtitle is Recovering from Soul Crushing RE Nightmares, which is quite a reference to last year's talk. And as you can see, this is progressive, so we're still working progress software, writing a deobfuscator, and we would like to stress the fact that this is not a personal attack on Chris Thomas, and also we would like to anticipate that our deobfuscator does resubstitution of those move instructions very carefully, I would say. All right, a little bit of, about us. So who are we, actually? Um, we are, well, mainly CTF players. We play for a team from Germany called Hackup Shore, and we invest a lot of time into solving crazy exploitation, reverse engineering, and cryptography tasks. Um, and whenever we are not playing CTF, then, well, I am trying to get a PhD in the field of program analysis, low-level program analysis and deobfuscation, and Clemens just finished his bachelor thesis. Um, he also had the doubtful honor of writing the thesis on demorphication, so he probably uh, now knows that move code very well and can elaborate on that a little bit later. <laughs> okay, um, to get us synced, um, I will try to cover the demorphicator um, at a high level, such that you know how it works or how it is made up internally. Um, so the story of Mophiscation um, is probably like this. Um, there is a strange discipline amongst computer scientists to find Turing completeness where you wouldn't expect it. And the original paper on this was by Stephen Dolan in 2013, where he summarized that um, even if you remove all instructions from the Intel x86 instruction set, but the move instruction, then you're still not losing Turing completeness, which is kind of surprising, I would say. And then two years later, Christopher Thomas came and implemented a compiler, actually, who actually did that. And that was released uh, at Recon 2015, last year. And he did that in two ways. So um, he had one version that he called the Morphoscator 1, which translated from BrainFuck to x86 move, which is not so surprising because well, BrainFuck is quite low level. But he also spent great amounts of time to write a C to x86 move compiler, which um, is basically implemented as a virtual machine, and we will cover some of the internal workings right now. So we have the two references there, if you um, are interested to read up on that. So let's assume we have a program that looks like this. So five basic blocks that are luckily, happily jumping to each other, and basic block three assumes that there is a loop. And then what many of you might know from malware or from industry standard obfuscator is, is something like this, um, called control flow flattening, um, where the obfuscator inserts a dispatcher um, that actually then does the basic block scheduling for you. So um, the left-hand version uh, clearly conceals um, how many possible paths are there through the program, and also you can't tell anymore what basic block is scheduled after what basic block. And Morphiscation now takes uh, the exact opposite way and creates something like this. So instead of flattening it, um, it does something we call linearization, which just aligns all basic blocks into one linear block that loops infinitely. So how is that implemented internally? Well, um, there is that static initialization stop, which um, basically registers two signal handlers. Um, one for SIGIL, which basically um, is a trick that the program is its own SIGIL handler, and that makes that basic block four, in order to jump to basic block zero in that image, uh, does not have to trigger an explicit jump, but could instead just um, trigger a SIGIL. Uh, in Domus' case, it's a, a move of a segment register into a general purpose register, uh, well, to start execution over again. And of course, um, those signals have to nest. And the other one is, um, of course, you don't want to lose your ability to talk to the operating system, um, which is why he registers another uh, signal handler for zigzag fault, um, 
which basically jumps to a dispatcher, which done co then calls uh, external library functions. So um, it does that by triggering sec faults. So uh, in context of morphification, uh, dereferencing zero means, well, do a library call. Okay, to best understand how this is possible at all, um, we have a, well, quite verbose high-level C program here, and I know that slides and code don't like each other very much, but um, what this program should do is um, it calculates the factorial of uh, the number that is passed in, Ar in argv1, and if you compiled that program, as printed on the left, um, you would get a control flow graph as depicted on the right. So how is that done? Well, one observation is that each instruction of each basic blocks block obviously needs to be executed each time it is passed, right? So whenever that loop uh, re-triggers, we have to execute all instructions again. And the problem is that not all instructions should manipulate our state. So the main trick of morphification is actually whenever you introduce a variable, you actually introduce two variables. So you introduce an array with two entries, and the first entry of that array is a discard location with th trash data, and the second entry at index 1 is the real data you're interested in. And if you follow that idea, um, then you can program a program like uh, you can see in that do-while loop from uh, line 12 to 24, which basically, well, um, takes a state variable, a global state, and evaluates that state, uh, whether it is, uh, well, in our case, we have state zero and state one. And if it's true, then it does the assignment on the left-hand side, the i and one, you can see in line 13, um, to the real data. And if it's not, then it's done, uh, the assignment is done to the scratch data. And well, if you apply that uh, iteratively, then you get that program calculating the factorial. Quite interesting. Um, and in context of morphification, um, this means that um, whenever we talk about something prefix cell, we mean actually an array holding two uh, variables, and one of those variables is scratch data. So a basic block in morphification is then always starting um, with a sequence that takes that target register, which basically is equivalent to the state, what we saw here. Um, and checks whether, let's, for example, take a look at basic block three, whether the current basic block is the basic block that should be executed. And if it is so, then that on variable is set to true. Um, the transformed uh, semantics of the basic block three, now written in move code, um, are executed. And at the end of that basic block, um, there is the sequence that the basic block checks whether um, the next basic block uh, should be basic block three or four. Remember, basic block three was the one that looped in the beginning. Um, and then execution goes on. Now, one thing to remark is that arithmetic, doing only move, is quite tricky. And Thomas implemented this using lookup tables. So um, you can imagine um, doing arithmetic for each and every uh, possible uh, processor uh, instruction can blow up the binary quite a bit. And if we look at some statistics here, for instance, on the right-hand side, we have a vanilla, we have vanilla compiled programs, and on the left-hand side we see the morphiscated versions, so we can see that program sizes increase dramatically by a factor of up to, well, 2,000 almost, so note that's kilobyte versus megabytes. And also execution times, because that loop has to be executed all and all and all and all, and all over again, is of course also quite awful. So um, if you compare the SHA-2-256 example, which basically just hashed 10,000 bytes together, um, took almost, well, a factor of, what's that, 4,000 times longer than the original version. So our thought when you saw that it was, well, it's quite cool, but it's also very slow, right? So who would ever in any productive way use that obfuscation technique? Yeah, well, and of course, we forgot about CTF organizers. So, <laughs> of course, it didn't take long until, well, challenges appeared during CTFs, where people thought it was a nice idea to torture CTF participants and throw morphiscated binaries at them. And at that point, we said, okay, no, this has to change. And if we deal with that, we deal with that rightly. So... Um, there's two easy solutions that we explicitly rejected. Number one, um, the brainfuck morphiscator, well, is easy because there is a one-to-one -one relationship 
from um, brain fog instructions to emitted um, move instructions, you could just statically resubmit it, uh, res resubstitute it, and you're done. Same goes for the C version, but, and that's quite cool, um, the original implementation of the Morpheuscator also has a hardening.py script uh, lying next to it, and what it does is it, um, well, prevents exactly doing those pattern-based, or the pattern matching based approaches. So um, it does register renaming, it does instruction reordering, it shuffles quite some bits, some bits. So we can't do any pattern-based approach anymore, and we're really forced to look at the semantics. And how we do that is now covered by Clemens. So um, first of all, when we designed the demorphoscator, uh, we had to uh, think about what were our goals because. Um, analyzing the Morpheuscator binary, as you saw, uh, can be quite tricky and quite difficult, even um, especially if you have to take uh, into account that the extra hardening uh, gets applied. So you can't, like Julian just said, you can't uh, statically uh, translate it back. So um, we sat down and uh, thought about what, what would be the main priority. And we came up with um, staring at a wall of uh, instructions is really bad and annoying. And it would help a lot if we uh, actually get the control flow back. And that was our main objective. Apart from that, um, we wanted to retrieve symbols like um, what, um, what table does what operation. So that if in the end you load it into IDA, you uh, know exactly what's going on, even though um, you have quite an amount of instructions so you can figure out what is happening. And as a third priority, or as a least priority here, uh, is um, replacing the lookups by its, uh, respect, respect, uh, by its instructions, by its uh, exactly instructions. Um, yeah, so that were the goals. And to recover the control flow, we, uh, we do it in four stages. Um, and in every stage builds on top of the previous stage, so in every stage we acquire some knowledge we need in the next stage. And in the beginning, in the beginning we don't have any knowledge about the program, apart from that it's mafiuscated, and that it contains the initialization. So we analyze the setup. After that, we um, have not enough knowledge to um, retrieve all the labels, then we can um, look where the jumps are and where are they leading. And from all this information, we uh, can finally build the control flow, graph, control flow graph again. And well, that was our main priority. So let's uh, get right onto it. How do, um, how do we analyze the setup? As Julia mentioned, uh, the first initialization sets up two signal handlers um, to do external calls and also to loop around. And it uh, set up the stack as well. And the interesting part is uh, here marked S1. It is uh, part of the main loop actually, but it is also statically um, in the binary and also not prone to any hardening because it's emitted only once. And that's uh, at the time where uh, the object files will um, get linked together or right before that. So um, you won't see any hardening on this part. So parsing it is uh, quite simple. And as you see, um, um, the on variable will be initialized here in um, the first statement as selector at place in it will be uh, set to one and in it is a variable that is uh, statically set to one in the uh, image of um, the binary, and after that in it is, is set to zero. That makes sure that uh, this basic block will only be executed once in the beginning of uh, when the binary is first started, and then it calls main and exits. It's just, it's basically, it's just setting up the execution of the other basic blocks. So from here, we know where is a cell on, and also we know where is on because, well, if you have the selector, we have the, um, on as well. Building on, on top of that, we uh, now can recover the labels. To do this, we run over the entire binary 
and pass instru instructions using a capstone. And when, um, when a label occurs, because uh, the way jumps are um, a MOF instruction itself cannot target the instruction pointer, so it needs um, those entry points into labels where the execution is set to on. And they, are, they look like the code here, the two lines. We, you have uh, the cell on, which is uh, set to one under a special condition. And we now have to evaluate the condition and find the label, therefore. And on the right side, you have an example here. We are using lookup tables. Um, and because the, um, it's a 32-bit binary, you can't have full 32-bit lookup tables, so it will be split into multiple uh, lookup tables, which makes uh, this operation quite quite a long, um, uh, quite a vast amount of uh, move instructions, and we have to put them together. That's the challenge here. And also in the beginning, we don't know what the lookup table does. So um, instead of seeing the um, equals equals here and, and seeing the end here, you would just have addresses, addresses into tables. And now we have to be the lookup tables. And what is the best, thing, best way. way to beat lookup tables? Well, you just use lookup tables. <laughs> um, this works for binary and boolean. For um, binary operations, we access a, um, a specific element in the lookup table, which is uh, distinct to this lookup table, so we make sure not two lookup tables have the same value there. And for boolean operations, we uh, calculate the score based on the results. For unary operations, uh, we hash the tables, which works quite good. Uh, yeah, now we have figured out what lookup table does uh, fit to which address. And now we can uh, translate um, back. And well, now we have here's the stream of instruction, which is exactly what I showed before. You might can identify uh, the equality uh, lookups and the end. Not? Well, I guess so. <laughs> well. um, and the worst part is we still have to t uh, teach our computer how uh, um, to work all the all the, the instructions together. So what we do is uh, we start at the end. We know um, that when we assign one to cell on, that the result A is uh, some kind of condition. And we start there. We uh, do a taint analysis going backwards. We uh, at first taint A. And the way taint propagates to um, move code backwards is um, quite obvious and quite easy to implement. So. Um, it works really, really well. And we can generate a, um, a graph out of it. And this uh, looks way more handleable. I, uh, I think you agree. And now from this graph, um, we still have a graph, and uh, it, we still have to handle it somehow. So what we're doing next is uh, we take this graph and translate it into an expression and feed it into an automatic theorem prover namely set tree. And um, this uh, automatic theorem prover will look at it and we ask, well, what value um, does uh, target have to um, take so that um, A evaluates to 1? So under which condition will cell on be set to 1? And it will output us a constant function, which is just equal the label. So we then have the label and uh, we just remember where the label was and what's the label. So the virtual address and, uh, well, the label. And this brings me to the third point. We uh, have to identify jump targets. And all those um, instructions have in common that uh, they access cell targets. So we do it uh, very similar to um, the analyzation of uh, the labels. We start from the selector of the target um, and see if, uh, if it's um, toggled under some condition, like you see in the conditional jump, all the others have no condition because uh, jumps will always be executed, returns will always be executed, indirect jumps will always be executed. And then we also have to acquire the label which we find in the subsequent instruction 
or uh, it could be something more complex like in the uh, indirect or return cha um, case. And it's um, not, as, not easy to distinguish those two cases, but with a taint analysis of X, um, you end up either with a very uh, simple case where just uh, the stack gets dereferenced, or you have something uh, way more complex, and the complex case is the indirect jump, the stack is obviously the return. And we um, then remember the position of the jump and where it, it leads us. This gives us a bunch of data. First, uh, we just have those labels and the jumps on the left side, A, B, C, D, E, F. Then we um, connect them in a meaningful way such that a label will uh, just execute to the next uh, block. And then we simplify the graph and we uh, get on a control flow graph on the right. And that's uh, all, we do to, all we need to do to recover the control flow graph control flow graph. Yeah, right, but so what? I mean, you don't remove all the moves that might be the biggest concern right now. Yeah, but um, it's, uh, um, it has the advantage that it can still handle ha um, hardened executables. We, we are doing a trade of uh, uh, a taint analysis, so it doesn't matter um, how the registers are named, it doesn't matter in which uh, order they appear because, well, it doesn't matter, matter to the taint analysis. The data gets propagated equally. Also, um, we get the control flow graph, which is uh, a ma major help in, um, in reversing the binary in the end. We also, what I didn't cover is we, we generate a patched binary, which we uh, then can execute or which makes it looking at it in IDA or something else way more pleasant. We generate IDA symbols because, well, going all the way, recovering the labels and the targets, we uh, go over all the all the um, all all the tables, and so on the way we just generate those symbols and we break them, uh, we get them into a, a form that IDA can uh, understand. So if you, if you load it in the end, the patch binary with the symbols into IDA, you have quite a different experience than um, looking at the Morpheus binary. Right, and last but not least, we're using all those fancy new frameworks. So if Mr. Nyen is sitting in the audience, I don't know, the creator of Capstone and Keystone. So thanks a lot. That really helped in creating the Morpheus <laughs> And also, thanks fly out to Microsoft for creating a set three automatic theory in Profer. And we actually had a demo. We had a small demo. But due to ongoing problems and due to the fact that everybody wants to go to the coffee break, um, I'm just quickly covering what the idea and the takeaways of that demo were. So we have this simple crack me. Um, and I'm sure that most of you will almost instantly be able to tell what the needed input should be for the F gets in line 10 in order to get the smiley face and not the sad one. Um, but what we would have done is then we uh, morphiscate this and then we throw this into the demorphiscator. And uh, then to prove our point, um, we would have taken this fancy new Angular binary analysis platform framework. Um, and the cool thing is that Angular comes with a symbolic execution engine that actually works for low level programs. And what you can then do is um, you can say, okay, whatever the F gets returns is symbolic data. So treat it as a formula, then execute the full program from line 10 to line 16 apply all those transformations to um, the formula, and then constrain RES, the result variable, to be zero. And from that, um, you can feed it again into a theory improver, and uh, you will get actually the correct solution. And I know this is pretty lame that uh, we can't show that live right now. Um, so all I can offer is, well, I have it there on my notebook, but unfortunately not in this one. Yeah, just come so to us and... If you're really interested in this, we. Just invite you, please come to us after the talk and we will show you that it actually works after demobfuscating it. And one of the takeaways also is that demobfuscation takes, well, less than a second. So it's almost as fast as obfuscating it. 
Um, so to conclude, um, this is the way you can reach us, um, our email addresses, also our PGP fingerprints. And of course, we are open sourcing everything. So um, the source code of the Deem Obfuscator, which is, by the way, about 4K lines of code. So um, there's many, 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 many things we couldn't cover. Um, also, well, a summary of the Deem Obfuscator. And if somebody wants to torture himself even more, <laughs> then there's Clemens Bachelor thesis that you might read with, well, which might be quite a moving experience <laughs> on 60 pages. And that's all we got for now. Yeah, it covers the... Yeah. Yeah. It covers uh, the basics of demofuscation more in depth and of the demofuscation as well. So it might be interesting to read, but it isn't necessary. Um, this presentation went Just over much. Shut up. It's, it's, we are at that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>